Right, so let's uh, let's get started with uh, today's tutorial. So today's tutorial is basically the sort of the last one with the material based on the studios we have covered. Okay. Um, then I, next week there will be just one more for a quick revision on uh, the things before the the final assessment. Correct. So originally it was planned for tomorrow. Correct. Uh, the original plan. Uh, or the schedule that we showed you but um, yeah so we pushed it back by one week so next saturday will be the final assessment okay so just take note of that and um, uh, so i think it's good so that you finish off that part earlier and then you can um, focus on your system all right getting it up and ready for the final assessment and i think it's a it's a good good uh, strategy because I think the past students were too stressed because the assessment is also in the last week and just after the assessment that Saturday is also the, the test also and also it is like too many things all happening at the same time all right so at least now I think it's better that we can finish off the uh, sort of theoretical assessment part first and you can focus on the uh, system and getting your whole uh, robot up and ready okay uh, before the final competition run. Okay, so let's, um, uh, let me share my screen and then we can start to, okay, so today's tutorial, we are covering quite a few uh, different uh, topics, okay, from secure networking to the SLAM to power management and so on. Okay, so we are just lumping together a lot of things that we covered in the last two weeks, okay, and we're putting it here. Uh, but I think around slightly more than one hour or so, we should still be done, okay? Okay, so let's get started. Okay, uh, so a few important points I would like to just point out, okay, before we start. So the first thing is, uh, I mentioned this before uh, in the lab, okay, that we do not have any extra time in the lab. Okay, in the past, we used to allow nighttime access, okay, for students to come back okay, after 5 until 9 p.m., Uncle Jalil or, or Uncle Joseph or whoever will be there to take care of the lab, okay, and, and you all can, can use it, all right, but now with all the restrictions, we can't do that, okay, so the only time you have is that three-hour uh, studio slot or two, three-hour slots that you have in the week, okay, so you need to really plan your time wisely, don't come there and then do coding and so on, try to do all the coding and everything as as early as possible. So when you come there, you focus on the testing, getting your data and fine tuning and so on. Okay, so try to use that time very, very wisely. Okay, and of course, a plan for contingencies, all right, in case the person with the robot cannot come, all right? So it's also more important now because if any of you suddenly have cough or flu, okay, uh, anything related to COVID, you will be given a five day MC already. Okay, so uh, if, uh, that should okay but of course you don't want anybody to be on mc but if let's say you are on mc uh, then you are the one holding the robot so within your team you already have to plan what you're going to do okay how you're going to pass the robot uh, or remotely you all want to access it and so on so plan for this in case that person is on mc and he cannot come okay the next thing is uh test progressively okay i have seen groups in the past they just dump everything in at one time and then hope that it just works okay so if it works of course everybody is happy but if it doesn't then uh, you are really stuck okay you really do not know where to go back to 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 restart the whole uh, process okay uh, so test progressively you know don't try to integrate all the, the things together and then test okay so test one aspect of your robot separately and then when you integrate it, also integrate that one particular uh, feature, test that after you integrate, it is still working, and then you move on, okay? And uh, that leads on to my last point here, focus on the core functionality. Okay, so the core functionality is what you must be able to do search and rescue operation, all right? Uh, so to do that, you need to do your remote uh, access, and you need to be able to view the LiDAR information, and be able to draw out the map. Okay, so within your team, by now you should already be start starting to discuss who is going to take what responsibility 
who is going to be drawing out or analyzing the map, who's going to draw it out, who is going to do the navigation, okay, let me sending the commands over and so on. Okay, so you need to uh, have a few dry runs of your own, okay, on the whole process, who is going to do what, how the whole assessment is going to be done so that you know how to react on that day, okay, who is going to do what, okay. So you have time, right, we have a, a few weeks where the rest of the, I mean, the rest of the weeks is, is just focusing on this, okay. So you have the time, you know, and if you use your time wisely, I am very confident that you can all do it, okay. So it's just a matter of planning your time very wisely while you're in the lab, okay. So use that uh, studio slot very wisely to do all the project related work, okay. And the rest of your team members, uh, okay, maybe some of you might be doing other stuff, okay, but just try to help out, okay, make sure that everybody can contribute in some way. Okay, uh, so let's go on to our tutorial uh, discussion. Okay, so the part one is on protocol design. So in protocol design, basically, uh, what we're going to talk about is how we have been communicating between the Arduino and Uno. Okay, so this is, of course, uh, uh, what I would say is the code base that we have given you, okay, to work with, uh, is actually a very good uh, foundation, okay, for you to understand how to do something like this in the future. All right. So when you are going to design systems where there's going to be communication between different sort of computing platforms, and you want to be able to send large amounts of data, all right. So this kind of a uh, the structure that we've given you is actually very good for you to, or template is very good for you to uh, leverage on. Okay, so basically, if you recall what we have done is, in the past, we created a packet structure, okay? And when we created a packet uh, based on this structure, and we populated all the packet field first, okay? So we said the first element is uh, what data, second element, and so on. And after that, we copied everything over to a buffer, Okay, by calling the mem copy function, and after that we will just send it out through the serial. Okay, so that was what we did before. Okay, now uh, if you look at the code that we have given you for the client server interface, um, the idea is the same, but now instead of using a buffer, we use an array. Okay, that means instead of using this kind of structure format. We pass everything into an array and we send over this array. Okay. So, why did we change this approach? Okay. And why did we stick with what we had earlier? All right. So, the reason is as you can see, systems are changing very fast. All right. And uh, even the RPI that you're using now, maybe after one or two years, might be upgraded. Okay. Uh, to a 64 bit baseline uh, RPI board, okay, and then the compilers, uh, behavior might also change, the configuration settings might change, okay, so because uh, things at the back end of a system can change, the hardware side can change, the compiler can change, all right, if we do what we have been doing before, then you always need to keep updating the whole code base to align with these changes, all right, so that is of course a, a, a hassle for us. And when, in, when we talk about the padding and so on, we also can, must, when we want to do padding, we also need to know exactly how the compiler works, how different systems will interpret it. We need to know the Indianness and so on, okay? Whereas if I translate everything to an array, okay, of characters, then that array will be received exactly as an array of character elements. Okay, so if you look at it, uh, the advantage of that is we will know, okay, uh, or you can say for sure that both sides would receive the exact data the way it was sent. Okay, only thing that we need to be sure of is the Indianness, okay, of the system. All right, but to ensure that we also have some uh, structures, okay, some uh, library functions that we can tap onto to convert, okay, data from the host to the network and network to the host and so on. Okay, so that is uh, what we're going to look at, how we actually are able to upgrade the system, okay, from the structure 
approach earlier on to now using this array approach. So what we are going to do is when we want to send this, let's say, sequence of uh, or this entire command packet over. Okay, so if you look at it, uh, coming back here. Okay, so the first byte is a command. Uh, so it's, it's a data tree, and then it's a command, and then four bytes, and so on. Another four bytes, and so on. Okay, so this is what we want to send over. And what we will do is we will take each of it and put it inside a buffer element. All right. So over at the receiver side, okay, this buffer which is actually an array, okay, of uh, data. You will just have to take it and read it in the same order, okay. So instead of looking at it in the perspective of how many bytes is this, how many bytes is that, whether it's fading and so on, we take that every uh, element is now contained within one array element. Okay, that means on the sender side, everything is now inside an array. Okay, so each element in the array is corresponding to some part of this information. And on the receiver side, I just read back in that same order. Okay, so it is much easier for me to perform this communication without worrying too much about other details. Okay, so the advantage is you can reassemble the data okay uh, very easily okay as long as you uh, match okay the indianness and padding all right so you do not need to worry about any particular uh, issues okay uh, and of course the advantage is that it works reliably regardless of machine word size Okay, that means even if my word size increases, doesn't matter because it's just a matter of putting it into more array slots, okay, and reading back from more array slots. Okay, so it is a much more elegant solution compared to what we were doing before. Okay, so that is the first part. Now the next thing is how could we implement such a data structure serialization? Okay, uh, if we were to try the previous approach on the LX client and LX server files. Okay, so the first thing is we need to uh, understand the byte ordering. So this is where the Indianness is taken care of. So we have a few standard functions here where you can convert from one order to another order. That means, let's say from uh, host to network and network to host and so on. So these are a few of the standard functions we can use. So this allows us to uh, or when we use these functions, we can be sure that the data will be reorganized in the correct Indian format, okay, between one uh, side and the other side. Okay, so these are all the sort of examples of the functions that we can use. So over here, okay, uh, if you look back at our original uh, structure approach, what we did was we, we, we did, uh, if let's say we have an integer x, characters E and integer Y, then we would first populate the structure. So inside this, you will populate the structure with the data that we want. And after that, you copy this data into the buffer. So we have a buffer and we put this data into the buffer. So this is what we were doing in the serialization code. Okay, so what we would do now is, uh, we would first, instead of directly copying the data, we would first convert it to the correct Indian format. Okay, so host to network. Okay, so we convert the data to X in or and convert it to the correct uh, Indianness format, and then we do a mem copy. So originally, your buffer is pointing here. Once I store the X variable inside, I will increment my pointer to point to just after this X, the amount of space I use for X. And then I do the same thing for the character. That means after I store it, I increment again and then do it one more time. Okay, so my data is now inside the buffer and I send the buffer over. So this is what we were doing all the while. And now on the receiver side, okay, the receiver side, what do I do? I create a same variable with the similar data structure. And now I copy from the in buffer, 
okay with the index initially pointing to zero okay so initially the index is pointing here all right and then what do i do i copy this much over into the other x okay and now to make sure the indianness is correct i convert from network to host it previously was host to network Okay, now I do it the other way around. All right, then after that, of course, my pointer is already incremented here. And then I do the same thing for C and then for Y. Okay, so this is basically what we did originally in the serialization. Okay, the, uh, this of course can still work, okay, but an easier approach would be the array approach. Why? Because in the array approach, we Take it everything to be one array element size. Whereas over here, I need to know the exact format of how my structure is arranged. Correct? Right? Whether I have a character, then integer, then maybe a float, a character, and so on. So I need to make sure that I account for this uh, arrangement of the different data types so that I can increment my pointer accordingly. Okay, when I'm trying to serialize and deserialize. Okay, so that is the sort of plus and minus of these two approaches. Okay, well, both are both good ideas, okay, which you can use in future, okay, when you have some similar requirement, okay, where you have this huge packet of data you want to transmit over uh, between one device and another device. So this is one way of doing it, either the array approach or the structure approach. Okay, so the, the way the serialization works, like what I said, is you must know exactly how many bytes. All right? And of course, in this case, you also need to custom write the entire code yourself. All right? So you need to know exactly the structure and you need to write the serialization deserialization code uh, that matches the structure. Okay, So it is a lot of effort. Okay, Now, there are also a lot of libraries available. Okay, so uh, things like protobuf, mavlink, and so on. Basically, what they, these libraries do is you specify the structure, okay, and you can auto generate the code for you, okay, based on whatever structure that you are actually going to deal with. Okay, so there are library functions uh, available that can help make our life easier, okay, if you have such uh, requirements in your project. Okay, so that is basically. A recap of the serialization and deserialization concept okay between the uh, the host and the uh, client okay now the next uh, section two is on the secure networking okay so in secure networking uh, let's look at the questions here okay so we are going to be talking about the certificate authority okay so this secure networking for your project is uh, the bonus component if you look at it all right so uh, you can you know, some one or two of your team members can work on it okay and try to get everything up and running okay if everything is working fine then you use uh, this secure approach and run your final assessment okay but if there are issues, okay, then you always have a fallback plan to just use the your normal approach, okay, using uh, your standard BNC and so on. Okay, uh, so one, one thing is uh, we have asked you to use your local, I mean, your own uh, local hotspot, correct, as your Wi Fi point. So this is also something that you need to uh, test out, okay, because if you remember, you are going to be seated in section two. And section one is where the competition is going to be run, okay, or the assessment is going to be run. Okay, so you also need to uh, test whichever hotspot you're going to use, where what is the ideal location to place the hotspot so that there is no interruption in uh, the link between your laptop and the robot. Okay, so so these are things that you need to try out also, okay, to make sure that you are able to have your network. Uh, going smoothly during the assessment. Okay, uh, so for coming back here, for certificate authority, um, we mentioned that uh, 
for your certificate to be accepted on web browser, they must have uh, be signed by a recognized certificate authority. Okay, so how do we enforce this requirement? Okay, so basically web browsers and OS basically what they do is they store certificates, okay, from CAs in a certificate stock. Okay, and it can only be updated by the system admin, okay, or the person who is currently managing the PC of the system. Okay, so you uh, should not be adding certificates, okay, unless you have system admin badge, okay, then you know what you're doing. Okay, and basically what happens is when your browser, okay, when you open a browser and you create a TLS session with the web browser, okay, the, the web server will present a certificate which has already been signed, All right? So the CA is basically the trusted uh, person, okay, who has signed this certificate, okay? And then your browser will also, will also search its own internal certificate store for the root certificate to verify whether the signature on the server certificate matches. So that is how you are able to know that this is a trusted and secure sort of session that you are having. Okay, now if you look inside your browsers, okay, different browsers have uh, different um, sort of uh, tabs on where they keep it. All right, so if you look in under Firefox, for example, okay, under privacy and security, you can see something like this where you can see all the certificates that your browser currently has. Okay, uh, of course, you can add your own certificate. All right, but if you add your own certificate, of course, it is only your. Uh, local system okay it doesn't affect other users okay anywhere else okay but these are where your certificates are stored so that when you are browsing you know whether it's a secure or unsecure connection you are having and of course uh, this is quite common nowadays okay if your certification fails okay that means when you try to browse uh, and you get this warning that means it's telling you that it is uh, uh, somehow it's not able to verify that this is a secure connection, but it always gives you the option of going ahead. Right? So uh, it's not shown here in this screenshot, but if you look uh, generally below this, there is an option for you to say you still want to go ahead and carry on. Okay, so that is uh, how browsers will give you a warning. Okay, if they detect that it is not a uh, secure uh, connection that you're having. Okay, the next is a sort of a case study. Okay, so basically, uh, I think a few years back, 2018, okay, uh, CA reseller okay, got hold of uh, 23,000 private keys, okay, uh, belonging to clients, okay. And what happens is the, the CEO asked Digicert to cancel all the website certificates that correspond to these private keys. Okay, so in order, uh, of course, Digicert refuses to do that. Okay? So the CEO emails all the private keys to Digicert. Okay, and so Digicert has no choice but to revoke all the certificates. Okay, so all the certificates are revoked means the websites are also will be going down overnight. Okay, so why is this important? Why, you know, uh, is it that when your private keys have been compromised, why must we revoke the certificate? Okay, because if anybody who has your private keys, okay, if you have gone through that, that the slides, you know that it is easy now for me to decrypt any message that you said. Okay, because you are sending, okay, from your website, when you are browsing, you are sending information, Okay, you are actually transmitting information through the public key, correct? That is encrypted. So whoever has the private key can decrypt it. Okay, so once your private key is compromised, okay, then anybody can create a fake website. Okay, and your private key will match the certificate. Okay, that is generated on this fake website as well. Okay, because the certificate uh, is already signed by the CA. Okay, so in that case, okay, they can set up a fake website and decrypt any information you send over. All right, so that is why, okay, the moment anything is, your private key is compromised in any way, 
you have to revoke the certificate and issue a new one. Okay. And of course, in your TLS studio, we also told you okay, that your private keys must never leave LX5. Okay, so this is of course, if anybody holds LX5, he can pretend to be LX and attach fraudulent signatures to your messages. Okay, uh, of course, I don't think anybody has tried to sabotage their friends okay, in our EPP2, but uh, it is still a good practice never to uh, reveal your private keys to anybody. Okay, so they should always be within the LX itself. Okay, so the next one is on SLAM. Okay, so for SLAM, it's a bit uh, interesting. Okay, so uh, I, I think most of you tried the SLAM and the, with the ROS and, and found it quite interesting. Okay, and um, uh, like I mentioned, uh, you need to think of how and your own approach. Uh, generally, I think only a small percentage of students actually used uh, ROS in the final assessment. Mo majority, the, uh, were still sticking with the standard, uh, the previous GNU plot and so on to do the mapping. Okay, so it is fine. Okay, whichever way you want to do is fine. You need to see what you're comfortable with and which system that you think that you are able to better uh, detect the surroundings and you feel that it's more stable and more manageable for you. Okay. So now uh, let's look at this Excel file over here, all right, where you collected some data, okay, and we provided some uh, points, okay, and we ask you to look for interesting points, okay, based on uh, and the analysis of calculating the 2D distance between the previous point. That means when I have one point and another point, they ask you to calculate some distance here. Okay, so any point which is lesser than one to eight, we say it could be just a, a bad data. Okay, and anything with a large enough distance to previous point is known as a spike. All right, so this is to detect any edge, okay, from the last point to the current point. All right, so let's look at uh, this example here. So in your spike extraction, Basically, what you do is you look at the XY plot and you look at the quality of the signal. All right? So when you look at the quality of the signal, basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to see whether this, any distance here, so if you look here D6 and D7 is talking about the quality of the signal. That means it is a point, okay? where it is a good quality signal. I mean, anything less than one to eight, you do not consider it, okay? It could be erroneous data. So anything that is above this, it is a valid point, okay? And then from there, you calculate this. So this is what? This is basically the least squares distance, all right? And you calculate the distance between the two points and that gives you the layout. Okay, so maybe uh, let me show you here. Yeah, so if you look at the difference values over here, okay, you can see that what we are doing is we are computing the square root of the power between B7 and B6 and X, uh, C7 and C6. That means the difference in the X values. So this is what? This is the difference in the X value. This is the difference in the y value and you are taking the square and square and square root okay so it's the finding the distance okay so this difference value what does it tell us okay it tells us that there is some distinction okay between the current point and the previous uh, points okay which means that i can now validate that this is a sort of spike, okay? And this could belong to some landmark, all right? So this is basically uh, an exercise to just show you how you can take some points, all right? And then use this, some uh, algorithm like this to figure out whether I'm detecting something, 
Okay, but this is just a simple example. Okay, let's go back to what exactly is happening in the actual uh, LIDAR. Okay, so in the LIDAR, all right, what we are actually looking at is this application or what we call the RANSAC algorithm. Okay, so the RANSAC algorithm is of course a highly complex uh, algorithm in terms of what it's actually doing. Okay, but we can understand it from a simple step-by-step -step perspective. Okay, so what it does is while it is scanning, okay, it first looks at all the data that it has. Okay, so unassociated other reading means you have a lot of points, but you haven't associated them with any particular landmark yet. Okay, and the number of readings is larger than the consensus. Okay, so what's the consensus? This is basically the minimum number of points you need to agree that this group of points is important. Okay, so you need a minimum number of points, okay, to say that, okay, this, when I hit this number means, I can say that, okay, this few points belong to some landmark, a wall or a table or something. Okay, and we have done less than n trials, okay. Then what we do is, we select a random reading, okay, and from this readings within a certain degree, okay, that means because the LIDAR is always spinning. So within a certain degree, you collect some data. So you'll have some data over here. Okay, and then we choose a certain number of samples. Okay, and using these samples, calculate a least squares best fit line. That means what it tries to do is, using these points, can I get a very nice line? Is it possible to come up with a line within this angle? Okay, if it is possible, okay, then it is above some consensus. Okay, that means I already hit the minimum. Then what I need to do is I calculate a new best least squares line based on all the readings to lie on the old best fit line. Okay, because your line can will always be updating. Correct, line will always be updating. So previously, maybe you had a line already. Okay, and now you have a new line. So I need to now correlate this new line with whatever line I had earlier to see how they match up. Okay, and then I add the best fit line to what we've extracted. Okay, and then we remove the rest of them and then we look at the next set of data. So in, in essence, what it tries to do is it actually tries to filter out the outlier data. Okay, so if you look at this picture here, on the left hand side is the original data. Okay, all the points that you have. Okay, and then what it tries to do is it tries to give you progressively the final best fit line, which is this. Okay, now let's let's see this in action here. So this uh, web page I managed to find. Okay, so let me. Okay, so this is a web page I found. All right, so basically, what it, it does is it actually shows you the sequence of what is happening. Okay, while the algorithm is running. Okay, so if I start through here, so at this point of time, what do you see? This is the first iteration. Okay, so the first iteration, it is scanning at a particular angle and it has a few points and it tries to come up with the best fit line. Okay, and then this is the next iteration. Okay. So in the next iteration, it also tries to check whether this line is a better fit compared to the previous line. So if it is not, then it will still keep the old line. So again, you have another line. Okay, so and then the by the fourth iteration, it found this line. Okay, where a lot of points can now come in to be aligned to this point here. And so the other lines that it tries will all, even though you can form some line, it still does not uh, go beyond the number of points that is uh, currently the best fit line that the algorithm has already detected. Okay, so you can see that even though the iteration is going, it does not change its line anymore. Okay, so this again start over. Okay, so you can see that basically what this does is it goes through the set of points and then from the set of points, it goes to find the best fit line through iterative process by trying to filter out the outliers. Okay, so it's quite a nice algorithm and it's not 
uh, it is you can see just a few lines of code here okay to actually get it to work okay so i'll just send this link over here okay in our chat for those who want later you can have a look at it okay so now let's go on to the uh, final part here which is on the power management okay so this section here basically it requires you to uh, remember some of your basic ETP1 concepts. Okay, so I hope you do remember them. Okay, uh, so pull up resistors. So pull up resistors are very common, correct? Because when I know you want to connect some uh, switches and so on, it is quite common to have a pull up resistor, okay, tied to one end of the switch. Okay, so the idea is that pull up resistor will give us some voltage. Uh, before so in this case as you can see this pull up resistor is tied to high okay so originally it is a one when i close the switch okay when i close the switch okay so this microcontroller input pin here when i close the switch it will, will then be connected to ground so it'll go low so when i release it'll go back high again okay so that is how this switch is configured Okay, so by default, you will read a 1. When a switch is closed, you will read a 0. Okay, until I release the switch. Okay, so why do you need the pull-up resistors? Because if you don't have pull-up resistors, then its voltage will be floating. Okay, so when you have a floating pin, uh, and that pin is also an input, configured to be input pin, then it is quite uh, dangerous in a sense that it can pick up some noise all right, and uh, erroneously give you a high or a low. Okay, so to prevent this, of course, we use pull-up resistors. And in our studios, we generally use, let's say, 10K or 12K or something like that. So how do you validate this uh, value that you're going to select? Now, first, let's look at the MCU input pin. So, a microcontroller input pin, okay, uh, when you configure it to be input, already has a very high input impedance. Okay, so it can go from one mega ohm all the way to 100 mega ohm. Okay, so this configuration, this configuration is considered a active low configuration. Okay, yeah, correct. Okay, so generally the, the active low active high is, yeah, we, we can say it depends on what happens when you press the switch or the button, right? Because now in this case, by default it is high. So when I close the switch, it goes low. So we say it's active low configuration. Okay, so when we are connecting the pull-up resistors, okay, we also have to understand that there is already an input resistance here, correct? At the microcontroller pin, okay, which is not visible to us, correct? And this can be a very high value, uh, one mega ohm to 100 mega ohm, okay? So now what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand how this 10K is going to interact, okay, with the uh, one mega ohm and what implications are there? Now, so the first thing is, can R be zero? Let's say now I put a short circuit here. Can R be zero? If R is zero, when I close the switch, what happens? Can anybody tell me what happened if I close the switch? If R is zero. Yes, it will be, uh, most likely you will see some smoke coming out. Okay, why? Because you will have a short circuit part without any resistance between VCC and ground. Okay, so there's a high chance, okay, the current is so large your wire might melt. Okay, so that is something that you should not do. Okay, you should never create a short circuit part between VCC and ground. Okay, so that is definitely not an option at all. Okay, R being zero. Now let's look at what happens if R is equals to 10K. 
So if R is equals to 10K, what will be the voltage here at the input pin? Okay, so the first thing you will understand is when R is 10K, that means it has some value. When the switch is open, okay, when the switch is open, the only pathway for current is here. All right, so basically what you have is, you have a CD circuit. You have R and R in. Okay, so current is basically your ohm's law, voltage divided by total resistance. Okay, and your voltage here, which is this point, is basically your voltage divider rule. All right, that means your resistance here, R in, divided by the total resistance, R plus R in, multiplied by VCC. Okay, so since your R is only 10K compared to here, which is 1 mega ohm, okay, so 1 mega ohm divided by 1 mega ohm plus 10K will is almost close to 1. All right, so 101.01 is close to 1. So if the final value is close to 5 volts, okay, so you get 4.95. Okay, so there is no issue, correct? Right? Everything is fine. Your switch is open, your input voltage is detected as 5 volts. So what happens when the switch is closed? Okay, when the switch is closed, what will happen? When the switch is closed, your current that is flowing through here has two parts, correct? Okay, so one is this part or this part. Okay, and from what we know about current flow, okay, from EPP1, current always will take the easiest pathway. Okay, so one is of course a short circuit, the other is one with very high impedance. So all the current will now flow through this part to the ground. So the only resistance that the current will see is this 10 kilo ohm over here, this R. Okay, so the current is now 5 volt over 10 kilo ohm, which is 0.5 milliampere. Okay, voltage wise, no issue because this pin is now directly connected to ground. So you will directly see 0 volt. Okay, so there is no major issue, all right? When the switch is open, it's 4.95 volts, I detect as 1. When the switch is closed, it's 0 volt, okay? I detect it as 0, so no issues. But now let's look at it from the perspective of uh, the power consumption as well, because we saw just now that in this case here, uh, the current is 0.5 milliampere, okay, when the switch is closed, okay? So if your current that you're getting is, let's say you think is too high and you want to save power, okay? And the way you can save power is, of course, you increase this resistance, because when I close the switch, I only see the R, all right? So if let's say now I say, okay, let me make my R one mega ohm, because if my R is very high, then the current will become very small, which I save power, okay? But is it such a simple decision to make without analysis? Okay, so let's see what happens, okay? If I just put it as one mega ohm, okay? What happens when the switch is open? When the switch is open, then this is one mega ohm, so effectively it becomes what uh, a voltage divider with two equal resistors. So if this is five volt, the voltage here will be two point five volt. Again, two point five volt is not considered a valid range of any logic. Okay, generally zero volt we say is somewhere between zero to zero point eight around there. Okay, around there. And for logic one, most systems is around approximately around three or three point something to five volt. Okay, so two point five is what we call the indeterminate uh, voltage region where it cannot be guaranteed to be interpreted as either one or zero. Okay, so that is the issue, all right? Because this is a switch connected to an input pin. Okay, so your input uh, logic uh, or your code may detect the switch wrongly. Okay, so how do you deal with this? Okay, so you can see that uh, designing something like this is not as uh, straightforward. You need to take into account the input resistance of the microcontroller to make the correct decision. Now, uh, let's follow up on this by looking at 
designing a voltage reference, okay, and see how the selection of resistors actually plays a part. Okay, so in many cases, okay, when we have a voltage comparator, okay, so if you recall your op amp, uh, okay, hope you all still have your material with you all. So if you remember op amp, if I have a voltage reference here, I say I have one volt, okay, this is my V in. Okay, so the output is what? The output is either plus V set or negative V set, correct? Depending on whether V in is greater than V minus or V in is lesser than V minus. Okay, so that is your voltage comparator. So in order for this voltage comparator to work, I need to provide a reference voltage. So a reference voltage, we normally will just think of it as Just give me a minute, huh? Okay. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. So for voltage reference, we can quite easily just use a voltage divider circuit like this to come up with the required voltage that we want. Okay, So in this case, we just want a perfect half. Right? So since PCC is 5, we want 2.5. So it's very easy. Any two resistors with the same value should give us approximately 2.5 volts here. Okay, So which one should we choose? Okay, So if you look at it from the perspective of just this circuit alone, Okay, if you just look at it from this circuit alone, any of this would still give the same perfect 2.5 volt. Okay, assuming ideal resistors. Okay, so there's no issue. But now, when I take into consideration that there is another branch here with a R in, things will change. Okay, so let's examine how things will change. Okay, so the first thing you understand is because of this R in, the voltage at this point is now a voltage that is now uh, formed by two resistors in parallel and then series with another resistor. Okay, so basically what you have is this. Okay, you have R1, then you have your R2, and then you have R in. Right, so if you simplify, what you get? You get this and this. So this is. R1, R2 parallel to R in. Okay, so the voltage at this point is still a voltage divider, but the two resistors, uh, one is still R1, the other is actually R2 parallel to R in. Okay, so that is now going to change things. Okay, and for current wise, it's now going to flow through uh, two pathways, correct? which is the combined resistance between R1 and with the parallel combination of R2 plus R in. Okay, so now let's look at what happens. Okay, so, so these formulas you can definitely put in and you can do all the calculation for all the different resistors. Okay, so let's see what, what happens. When the, both the resistors are 100 ohm, okay, your reference voltage you get is 2.499 which is roughly, again, very close to 2.5 volts. Okay, so VNF wise, no problem, but your current is very high. Okay, why is your current very high? Because your current is VCC over this. All right, and if you recall, okay, when you have two resistors in parallel, the equivalent resistance will always be what? Will always be closer to the smallest resistance. Okay, if you remember your parallel circuits, okay, when you have two resistors in parallel, okay, the eventual resistance will be closest to the uh, smaller one. Okay, so for example, if I have one and 100, okay, then when I simplify it, the final resistance will be very close to one. Okay, very close to the smaller resistance. So in this case, what happens is 
when you have 100, sorry, when you have 100 parallel with one mega ohm, you will still be closer to 100. Okay, so the current, so the total resistance seen by the circuit is still very small. Okay, in part B, you have again 10k, 10k, your VREF is again very close to 2.5 within 1% deviation. But your current is now a lot smaller. Okay, your current is a lot smaller. Okay, because now 10k is a lot more uh, closer. I mean, it's to one mega ohm compared to 100 ohm. Okay, so compared to 100 ohm, 10k is a lot closer to one mega. Okay, so you have a significant reduction in the current. Okay, but the moment you have one mega and one mega, what happens? Then things will change because when I have one mag and one mag, okay, this is one mag and one mag. What happens? Then this one will become 500 mag. Okay, so your voltage at this point, okay, I'm oh, sorry, 500k. Okay, so the voltage at this point is now going to drastically change because this is now a significant uh, impact with the voltage divider that you're going to have between the two resistors. Okay, so that is why your VREF is now much smaller. Okay, so even though increasing your resistance to one mag, you can have a very small current, your VREF is now totally off. Okay, something that is not acceptable. Similarly, if you go 10 mag, 10 mag is even worse off. All right, your, your VREF is very much off and even though your current is much much smaller okay so i think this is a good example for us to understand that uh, even though many times when you want to use a resistor for something we uh, sometimes don't think too much all right we just go to the shelf we just grab some resistor that you know can work and then you just put it in okay so uh, it can work okay uh, but of course in cases when, where you uh, now interfacing the circuit to some other part of your design and then there is an, uh, there's, there are some side effects that you need to be aware of. So this shows you that. Okay. So, uh, so in choosing voltage reference, of course, you want to choose appropriate component values that fulfill your requirement of the VREF that you want in this case without compromising the, or having too much of current, okay? So of course, you can always say that I, I still choose part A because, or option A because it's, it works and it's still 2.5 works, no issues, but the current drawn is of course too high, okay? So that is why uh, we also have introduced that power consumption element inside your assessment, correct? Too, so that you are aware of trying to design it in a very efficient manner, okay, whatever you're doing. Okay, so in summary, basically, I think this tutorial covers things like compiler, behavior, data structures, Indianness, okay, some concepts of the secure networking and the hardware choices as well. Okay, we need to be mindful of the decisions we make. Okay, so I think that sort of wraps up the tutorial. Okay, so let me just go back to the first slide for those who came late so that you, don't uh, miss out. Okay, so as I was mentioning in the beginning, okay, you do not have any additional uh, time in the lab besides your two, three hour slots. Okay, so you need to plan and use that time very wisely. Okay, and in case of the person with the robot being unable to come, okay, please plan ahead on what kind of contingency you will have. Okay, is it possible the night before somebody can deliver the robot to someone else or you do some remote access with a person working from home or something like that, okay? And uh, the other thing was uh, test your system uh, part by part, okay, progressively because sometimes uh, you may make changes in one part of the code and you think that it does not affect anything else but maybe your friend also made some change uh, in some similar register or something okay, because he was trying something else. Okay, so uh, when you integrate something, test that nothing else is broken. Okay, and then you go on to the next step and so on. 
okay, and focus on the core functionality first. Okay, so things like power consumption, of course, is important because there is some assessment part to it, but do not uh, try to put all of that inside, you know, and then test your system from the beginning. Okay, do all that is important first, and then you slowly start to put in the power consumption part, then put in the color sensor part and other things. Okay, and then you uh, integrate part by part. Okay, then you will at least feel that it is uh, safe to do so. Okay, and of course, another thing is your code. Okay, though you, you should be using Git to backup everything. Besides Git, you can also have your own local backups, okay, separately uh, to keep track of some code base uh, that was working. Okay, so use Git, but at the same time, you also keep your own local copies okay, with you so that you are able to fall back on things that you know are working. All right, and of course, the last thing that I forgot to put here was the hardware uh, design part, okay? Uh, I mean, when I walk around, I see a lot of wires everywhere, okay, especially the motor control part and things like that. Uh, as before, uh, one wire comes out, the thing will not work, okay? And then you are panicky on the spot because something came out in that last minute. Okay, so if you are using wires with a breadboard, it's fine. Make sure everything is safe and secure. Okay, don't have anything, uh, or don't have two long wires trying to wrap around all over the place, right? To cut them short or neat and keep them tightly wrapped around your components. Okay, if you want to prototype, you want to do soldering, we can give you everything, okay? We have all the protobots, okay, component, uh, sockets, everything we have. Okay, so if you want to prototype your uh, motor driver circuit board, okay, and make it a bit more secure and safe, also you can do it. All right, and besides that, like I said, uh, some of you may think of adding uh, additional layers or splitting up your robot into different staggered layers. You can do that. Okay, you can, we have all those connector or extender rods available. Okay, and if you want to 3D print, you can also go to the maker's lab. Okay, so the maker's lab was a bit uh, slow recently because the staff uh, had changed, okay, but a new uh, person has already come on board. Okay, so it should be up and running already, okay, as the usual timing. Okay, so if you want a 3D print, you can also do that, okay, and you can integrate whatever you want. All right, so components-wise, I think some of you are asking me, you can buy from wherever you want, okay, uh, but again, check that you are given a proper receipt and check whether they have local distributors uh, or they have local stock. Okay, so uh, sometimes uh, the website might not be so clear. So it's good to call them or email them to check. Do you have local stock that you can deliver within one week or two weeks? Okay, you don't want, some, you don't want something to be ordered already and you pay already then they say it is no stock, you need to wait for another three weeks to come. Okay, so check first and then you can buy, or uh, you can directly go down to assembly or SG Botic or and buy also, okay, so that you carry on the spot. Okay, so I think for next week tutorial, we will be actually going through some practice questions, okay, uh, to help you all get a better idea. So I think this week, uh, we will, uh, I mean, over the weekend, we'll release some practice questions, and then next week, we'll have one uh, session to go through some of these practice questions so, so you understand the type of uh, the style of questioning uh, for the next assessment. Okay, so I think that's all I have. Any uh, questions anybody wants to ask or clarify regarding the... Okay, so the assessment for next Saturday would be more or less the same mode of operation. Huh? So it will be online, luminous quiz, open book, uh, similar MCQ plus MRQ, uh, open, yeah, open book and uh, all the stuff that was not yet covered in assessment one. Everything else will be covered here. Okay. Okay, so this week you should already be starting to go through and prepare yourself. Okay, and then once we release some practice questions, you can use that for revision as well.
Okay, assessment one syllabus will not be asked. Okay, that means we will only focus on the material covered after that. Means whatever is not covered in assessment one will be covered in assessment two. Okay, so if any questions, you can ask me. If not, I think that's all I have for today. And I will see you. Okay, so like I said, just come to the lab. If you want to come earlier, you can come to the lab earlier. Okay, Uncle Jale is very early. Usually by 7, 7.30, he's already in the lab. Okay, so if you want to come in earlier, you can just come in earlier and you can start your work. You need to come at 9. Okay, by 7, 7.30, he's already there. Okay, so you can, can just carry on with your work, okay, this few weeks, and anything will be there to help you, okay, me and the TAs, all right? So thank you very much, okay, I will see you all, okay, on Tuesday.